and welcome back to um, the University of Europe for the Applied Arts um, to our Canon keynote speech, um, which will be by Yevgenia Arbugayeva. Um, welcome, Yevgenia. Um, just a quick, um, quick biography of who you are. Um, you're a photographer from the Russian Arctic region. You grew up in Yakutsk, and that obviously gave you a very special connection to the people and the region there, and a particular insight into people's lives, and that makes for these amazing uh, photo projects you have produced over the years. Um, you are a, an award-winning photographer and have been funded by Nat National Geographic and uh, have been selected as our Canon keynote speaker. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dagmar. Um, very nice to be here with all of you today, and I hope that everybody's review were useful and inspiring. Um, I remember I got my first um, assignment, big editorial assignment actually from portfolio review. So I know it can be quite um, a turning point in, in some people's career. Um, I will just start um, my presentation and here really I'm gonna share some of the older work and some new work. And even though I've been working in many different regions around the world, of course, Arctic remains my, um, has my heart and it's my home. And in many ways, it's, um, it's something that I continue doing and kind of building story by story, brick by, by brick, kind of my understanding of my own homeland. Um, and also I'll, I'll just, as I, as I go along, I'll just try to, um, talk through what were the production challenges and, and other things that um, I've been um, uh, overcoming or getting support from people to, to create this work. And um, the first project um, is Tixi, it's really old now and I feel like it's, it's been shot by somebody else and not me, but um, I'll share it because it, it's something that um, kind of pushed me to on, on the path that I'm still on. So I was born in town Tixi. Here it's on the map. You can see it's, it's quite uh, remote and far location. And actually, I'm really thankful that, <laughs> um, that I was dropped there uh, by a bird or someone else because it's um, this, this, this place is truly um, amazing and, and challenging, of course. And this first couple of photographs I want to show um, I shot right out, out of school. I went to International Center of Photography in New York. And of course, at that time, I really wanted to, I had lots of inf influences and I wanted to, to, to be the successful photographer. And um, I was in many ways copying many of photographers and that was very frustrating. And um, it was hard to find my own voice. And um, I decided to go to my hometown because I haven't been there for, for, for since I was eight years old. So when I first arrived, I saw this very bleak town that didn't look like anything from my memory. Um, and the photographs that came out of it um, were not <laughs> very inspiring, all great colors. And I was just wandering around this, uh, this town, um, photographing just kind of ruins and visiting my home. Um, and things like this, and it felt really depressing. Um, and then I thought this was not a good idea. I will never, <laughs> I will never be a good photographer. And I just was sitting uh, on on the beach and looking into the sea. And um, I saw this girl. She was there with her mom. And I just took this one picture, and we, we were chatting. She remembered my parents, um, the mother of the girl. And I, never, I didn't really think about this picture at all and, until I came back from Tixi and just started to look through photographs and I was not happy with any of them. But then this picture kind of made me think, how does this girl see Tixi? How does she, because she's about the same age uh, that I was when I li lived there. So I decided to give it another try. And this time I decided not to, not to think of success or anything that like not to think of outlet where this project will go and actually kind of give myself a last chance to um, to just 
do something that how I feel, not not how my rationale dicta- dictates me or anything else. So I came back, I found this girl and they were very welcoming. They welcomed me in their home and I stayed with them. Um, they kind of almost adopted me and um, uh, Tanya's mother, she was a teacher and she, they have this amazing um, library of old children books. And these are the books that I read when I was a kid. And the aesthetics of these books, like the, the, the covers really brought me back to, to my childhood. Like this book is about um, North, uh, North Pole, Soviet kind of exploration of North Pole. It's all, it was very heroic, the, the whole era. And Tixie was also on the map of this Arctic exploration as the, the biggest um, seaport on the Northern Sea Route. And all the stories were converted into children books. And that made us dream of becoming explorers ourselves at some point. And of course, also there was a lot of um, um, romanticism about space and about, of course, uh, influenced by Yuri Gagarin, the fir- first astronaut. And so as I was going through those books, um, I started to, my, my kind of, my mind started to be transported to that time of my childhood. And in a weird way, without knowing it, this aesthetics of those books kind of started to be imprinted in my, um, in my brain, in my eyes. And then something interested, interesting started to happen. I started to take photographs that I thought are like postcards from my childhood. And so um, this became very interesting and I completely forgot actually about the reason I'm doing it. It was just a personal journey and collaboration with Tanya and hoping to, to capture town for her. When, so when she grows up, everybody in- inevitably leaves the town because there's no universities. And, and so she, she left as well. And so I, I wanted to, to leave something for her and for myself as a memory. So we were um, wandering around and of course the space theme came back. Um, uh, everywhere you go, there's this um, rocket themed um, children playground. There are so many of them that I think every child in Tixie has his own or her own um, personal rocket. And of course the, the former glory of the, of the seaport now is a, is a um, cemetery of old ships. And, um, and this is a playground for kids. So here, um, Tanya is playing Titanic. And there were lots of also very long days and, and um, I, I should say nights because it's polar night. There was, no, there was no light during winter and very stormy. So there was a lot of free time and time that we didn't know what to do with. And this is also something that, you know, when you're a child, it feels like, um, time is infinite and um, we just played with it and went for walks. And this picture in particular, even though it's not something particularly special, but for me, um, it symbolizes the, uh, that vision that um, people have um, in the Arctic, um, because this is actually in February when the sun just started to show itself out of the horizon. Um, so people see the sun after three months of darkness. And Tanya told me that we have to go and photograph um, this hill, she calls it mountain. There's no, it's just this is like the highest point of, of, of the town because it's very flat, it's tundra. And she said that this, in this particular light, it looks like blueberry ice cream. So we went and we made this picture. And the more I think, the more I interacted with Tanya, I thought how, how much the understanding of color is influenced by, by your childhood and the place where you're born. And this is something that you, you can't control really. And the sensitivity and, um, of tonalities, I think really comes from different shades of snow and light. And there is a, in, in, at night, there's all the shimmers and, um, and stars. And here on the background, the aurora just about to appear. And um, this is when I also started to photograph with long exposures. And when I first discovered long ex- exposures, I thought that this is something, you know, um, like camera became um, a, like a magic tool, like a magic wand that can capture something that is invisible to an eye. And then of course we kind of got carried on 
uh, to other <laughs> dimensions of our imagination. And we started to try to hunt for ghosts because everybody knows that this house is haunted. So we tried to um, see the ghosts. We couldn't see the ghosts. So we, we, we decided to recreate it with our shadows and things like this. It was just a really fun, fun time. Um, and this is a snowstorm. In fact, it can be so strong that um, when you go out in this, well, it, preferably you don't go out, but if you have to go out in this storm, people do three rounds around the building um, to see if they can find, you know, find their ground. If not, they come back home. Um, and because you can easily get lost and, and just, I suppose, picked up by the wind. And um, this is the New Year's night. Um, it's, um, it was before I lived with the with the, with Tanya's family. Um, I just stumbled upon this little situation of um, tired dog after celebration. This photo um, became a cover of the book that I made, and for me, it's it's an important photo because um, Tanya really wanted. She, she, this is her favorite dress, and she really wanted to to wear it because it, it, she started to grow out of it. And you know, as if you remember when we were kids and we have something really favorite clothing and we know that we can, like tomorrow we will grow out of it and it's a pity. So she was like, I really wanna be photographed in, in this dress. And so we were wandering around and, um, and then there's this homeless dog that was following us. And there were, there's a lot of homeless dogs in Tixi because when people, um, mi migrated from, from the town, um, which was a, a huge migration after fall of Soviet Union, the town from 12,000 people it, it is now only 4,000 people. So you can imagine the, the scale of kind of exodus from, from, from this um, region. And sadly, people, many people left their dogs behind. And so there is lots of kind of almost wild dogs now running around. And then this is another character who, um, Uncle Vanya, he's not my uncle, but in Russia, we, we kind of a, like a, a sweet um, ad admiration way of calling an older older man. Um, he sadly passed away a few, a few years ago and he was this really rare spirit. Uh, he was a sailor. He came on the ship from Latvia actually during Soviet time and he fell in love with this place and um, He's very lonely and I should say he's, he's, he's alone. He's not lonely because he's very much in, in nature and also um, he, can, he knows how to keep his own company and he has this little shack where he goes to read books and um, write. And this is inside his apartment in town. He's, he was quite an eccentric character. Um, and he he left me some memos actually for um, of how to what not to miss in life uh, when I, when I, as I go on with my life and I sometimes um, revisit these notes um, of kind of reminders of important things and also things to 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 notice especially in the Arctic the blooming of of a certain flowers and um, the when the moment when the sea freeze from ice and things like that. And this is him fishing. This is already in June. Um, so the sea just starts to, um, to free from ice, but I'm sure, <clears throat> I'm sure now that actually the timing is very different. Already, it's been already almost um, eight years or so. And, and, and already, of course, the, the changes are huge because of the warming climate. Um, this is this was uh, at the meteorological station when um, Tanya really wanted to. She was fascinated by those meteorological balloons, and um, she asked me if I can ask meteor meteorologists to to have to give her um, one of these balloons to play with, and she was really happy. This is um, one of the bars in. Um, in the uh, seaport. And this is the last image just really um, of this story because I've been going there for two years and um, 
a few times a year. I was really just trying to photograph different times of the year, but also kind of following Tanya as she grows and as she becomes teenager and no longer a child. And this is the final image um, of the series when this was actually the day when I was taking airplane um, back home. Uh, and so the Tixi project um, opened up a lot of um, kind of ways and, and, and doors for me because after I finished this project, I, I won uh, like a Oscar Barnack award and this, this project has been published in many magazines. And it also did something very important to me. It, it confirmed that I can just really be myself and and, and dream, you know, and, and, and try to capture my dreams and it's okay and it's not naive and it's actually, you know, people are interested in it and people understand it. Um, and that kind of revelation I kept with, I kept um, throughout my, my career. Um, one of the things that um, I always dreamt about and I, you know, I, I, I love reading books and as a kid I was reading a lot and one of my favorite books was Two Captains and it's a story of this lost expedition of two ships that, that went to North Pole in search of this mythical um, land, mythical island. They got lost and then there is this brave young man pilot who goes um, in search of this expedition and um, I was fascinated by the story, of course, and this, there was a, 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 an, an old Soviet film about it. This is the protagonist. And so he goes, he's looking for this ship and he's kind of seeing these visions. And, um, and as I was watching this film and reading this book, I was trying to, to, to understand where he was actually going how, and trying to map in my head the places that he visited and the islands that he visited. And in 2013, I wrote a letter to, um, I found out that the only way to, to get to those um, remote places um, is to go by the ship. And actually the, all these remote places, the smallest islands, you know, some islands are just three by four kilometers wide, um, really just tiny rocks in the middle of Arctic Ocean. And there are meteorological stations there. And some of the stations are meant just by one or two people. And um, I learned that there is this ship that delivers supplies to all these hard to reach Arctic stations. And I wrote a letter to a meteorological organization. Uh, and I said that I'm, it was, a, now that thinking back, I, I, I feel like it was a quite a naive a letter, but it's probably <laughs> really worked in, to my advantage. Um, I, I remember I just wrote that I'm this photographer from Tixi and I always had this dream. And even though this project is not supported by, by anyone, um, I just really want to get on board and I'm ready to do any work or anything. And um, surprisingly, my letter was signed by the, by the director and I was led to uh, come on the ship. And at this time, I was just, again, I am, I am without any assignment. I'm just curious to explore these places. And uh, there were quite interesting people on board, like a priest, Dmitri. Um, I'm not religious, but anyways, we, we became really good friends. He's like priest, but he also has this very hippie personality. He, he's, um, he, he was listening to really good music, jazz, and, and he was reading Kurt Vonnegut and like all these things that are, I thought is not really, <laughs> it was strange to see priest. Um, I guess he, he really changed my, my understanding of, of, of personalities of, of um, religion servants. And um, but other, other than that, all the people on board were quite reserved and grim. And because it's a long journey, it was two and a half months on board. And it's a hard work. It's you basically always on, on at sea and then you, you, you land on, on the, at the station on the island and people just unload supplies. It's um, in bad weather, lots of heavy stuff. And then they come back on board. So atmosphere on on board was uh, was qu quite melancholic i should say 
and this is one of the uh, one of the um, stations which I was dreaming to visit. This is Franz Josef Land, very close to North Pole, and um, this is kind of um, a weather station with some abandoned um, buildings there. And again, I'm I'm going, I'm, I'm photographing, but again, I feel that I am not anywhere close to creating something that I how I feel about the place because for me it's important to kind of find find a way where images and the story um, that I try to visualize really matches my own feelings about the place. And at this point it wasn't doing that and until and also because I had very little time, I, I, we would unload and I would just have 30 minutes. Um, so it was very hard to make a, a, a good photographs. And as we were going uh, to this unknown places, I kept thinking about Hyperborea as an um, uh, ancient uh, Greek understanding of Arctic when nobody had been to Arctic and they called it Hyperborea where the land of, um, of Hyperboreans, these giants, uh, kind giants that live on this land um, beyond the North sea, North Wind, where actually it's tropical and it's all this kind of Eden on Earth. And I thought that still we have such a such little understanding of Arctic that in a way, in my mind, it was still a Hyperborea. And so, as I, as I visited all these places, kind of being teased by all these places, but never being able to, to spend time there, I started to, to map my um, idea of, of places where I want to go, some that I already visited, some that I researched. And I've been actually um, writing um, grant proposals for, for a few years, for many years actually, and applying to different um, grants um, but not receiving them. And actually I'm happy that, that it happened that way and it gave me time to process things, but also to grow as a person, as a photographer and get ready for, for things that were about to come. And so in 2018, um, I became a National Geographic Storytelling Fellow and um, I wrote a proposal for, for this dream project of mine. And, um, and I went and I revisited places that I've seen in 2013. And um, that's a, a little bit, I, I ran a bit um, ahead of myself, but also coming back to this expedition in 2013 when I'm on my own on, on, on the ship, this is the view from, from my room. And these are the oranges that were given to us um, once a week in, on, on Sunday. So that was a really exciting day for vitamin C in this gloomy weather. And so one of the stations that I was fascinated about was this Hadavariha station and this, this um, um, with what will become a, a, a story called Weatherman. Um, and I met this, uh, the chief of the station, Slava, and he, he was such a fa fascinating character that I thought that I really need to come back. And of course, um, it's not easy to get there. Uh, the only way to get there was by helicopter. And I realized at that point, um, I wasn't, um, you know, um, it was hard for me to organize something like this on my own. So one of the things that um, I did, I um, kind of made a, a, a story pitch and, and a collection of images that I, that I created on this, on this journey. Um, and sent it to uh, Barbara Staus from uh, Mara magazine. And she was very supportive of the project. And I said, look, look this, is, this is what it could be in words. This, the, the current images don't give it justice, but I know there is a potential in this. And this is this amazing person. And I wanna go there. I wanna go there in winter time. And then I wanna go in, in autumn and it's very expensive. I need, I need funds. Um, to get there. And so partially uh, this project was supported by Mara magazine and then uh, I also applied for a grant in France. So it was very tight budget really for just literally for, 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 for logistical expenses. And um, yeah, so I, in, in, in winter I arrived and I, um, and I photographed this place. 
um, in winter because I thought uh, that as a as an Arctic person, I I felt that I really want to photograph the essence of polar night because polar night is not just it's not just um, like um, a, a, um, a geographic phenomenon. It's also a state of mind, really. And when people even live through polar night, it just puts you in 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 the mood and in the atmosphere that I couldn't find anywhere else. And it's something that cannot be repeated in in any I think in any place in the world, really. And uh, so yes, I was photographing uh, just a routine of Slava. And still the story, even though it's quite, it's been some time now, but it still doesn't let me go in the sense that I became really interested in the work of, of scientists and climate scientists and meteorologists and, and biologists and all these people who are giving their life at sometimes at very high cost um, to research in the Arctic. And these are the people who are, who don't get much in return, really, there is no, you know, prize for being a meteorologist. There's no recognition um, in any way. It's just a very hard um, work and hard life, but it's something that, you know, um, Slava cannot live without. It's, he, his dedication is just really impressive. And it just made me think how much all the information that we're getting about climate, about animals in the Arctic, it really comes, there are these people who are living in this remote outposts and who are reporting day by day, um, in, in Slava's case, it's every three hours reporting the weather using this old crackling radio. But now it's um, uh, this, this station as it is actually, it, it doesn't exist anymore because it was um, renewed. And there's now this new building with uh, new technologies and, and satellite internet and all this thing. So I'm really um, happy that I was, I managed to to cap to to witness this kind of era that is now it seems like um, quite long gone. And uh, so this is the the new kind of so I, I thought I also when I did this story, I thought this is just it didn't feel like a complete story. It felt like um, it felt like a chapter of of over bigger over bigger um, work of a bigger project of a bigger story and um and again i was trying to figure out how to how to um uh, add to this kaleidoscope of this arctic stories and with the with the support of national geographic fellowship um i went to this place called canyon nose it's a lighthouse and this is the map of um so this is barren sea and there is this um very narrow peninsula and right on the tip of the peninsula, there is this lighthouse. And I visited this lighthouse in 2013, just really, really briefly. And at that time, there were about five people working there. It's a lighthouse and meteorological station. But in 2018, when I called the meteorological agency and I was like, who's, you know, I want to go there, who works there? And I found out that there is only um, two people working there and it's a, it's a couple, it's a young couple. And I thought that this is an incredible, um, uh, story because it's, it's literally like living with the, you know, like, a uh, the saying of living with a loved one at the edge of the world. And so I went, um, there was no, no, no way to get there really. I mean, in, in summer you can go by ship. But I wanted again to to go um, in winter, and this time I wanted to go in in January, um, um, sorry, in February, between January and February, where at this time you will already see the light, but the blizzards are very very strong, and again there is this I wanted to capture this phenomenon of of complete whiteout because this whiteout is is one of my favorite um, sensations actually, because when you are in this whiteout condition, you just, it just feels like you're just floating in, in the emptiness. You're just in kind of out, out of space or something. And, and I was hoping that I can, I would experience it there and it, it did happen. And every time with, with each of the stories, of course, because 
it's so remote, you cannot really um, plan for how things will go. You know, you, you, you cannot plan how people will receive you. You don't know how to, um, if, if you will even get there, because for example, in, in, this, in this instance, I, um, I, I didn't know how to get there. So I just looked in the map and I found the nearby village. Well kind of nearby and so I flew into this village and I, I, I looked for hunters who could drive me there by snowmobiles but nobody wanted to go because there's no road and nobody ever been there but finally I managed to convince them and, and we went and it took us 14 hours by snowmobile because we got lost and so it was an experience on its own and so you never when I work I never know if, if, if this all this kind of preparation and trouble is really worth it because you don't know how people will respond or what are you going to find there. So it's, it's, it's really um, like a lottery and I'm so thankful to universe that um, oftentimes, I should knock on wood, um, oftentimes it's just even better than I, that I imagined. And so this is the couple Ivan and Evgenia, we share the same name. They're not married, they, they, were, they were dreaming to have a wedding, but because of different family circumstances, they couldn't do it. And, um, and so she was telling me about her wedding, how she wanted it and the dress and all these things. And one day they were um, uh, collecting water to, to, to measure salinity because they do also meteorological um, data gathering there. And they were just standing there and I thought, wow, this is, this is your wedding picture. And this is, you know, this is all so gentle and so beautiful. And like, it all looks like a lace, like a white lace. Um, I, as, as you've noticed, probably I, I really love doing still life um, images. And um, this is the, the apples that I brought to, to Evgeny and Ivan and um, that were wrapped in, in newspaper to preserve them from, from being frozen. And as they were laying here on the, on the table, I thought that this is, um, it really just reminds of the, of the landscape that these people live in. Um, this is the shack on, uh, on the shore of, of the sea where the, um, where the uh, uh, icebreaker ship comes and docks. Um, and so Ivan wrote Krai Zimli in Russian, which means edge of the world, just in case people didn't know where they are. And um, this is the only ship, this is the only time these people get supplies, so once a year. So you can imagine most of the things are, most of the, of the food is dried or canned. So that is why I thought that apples would apples and other fruit would be a, a really good treat. And indeed they, they were really happy. This is a um, um, graveyard on, on the shore of the sea of the sailors that died nearby. And also um, a family of lighthouse keepers who died of typhoid in the uh, 1930s. Uh, and uh, about at that time, I was all, I was really kind of diving into into um, historical accounts of Arctic exploration, and of course, uh, oftentimes they are very brutal and um, stories of colonization and and things like this. But one of the beautiful things that I found of were those watercolors of first explorers of the Arctic landscape. This idea of the capturing of the sublime and and I was dreaming on encountering at some someday this the scene that can kind of bring me closer to that um, to that notion of of sublime and exploration and when I was in Canyon Nos and this is the bay where Evgeny and Ivan go every day to to record the water temperature and ice condition and, <clears throat> and other things. And I saw this, um, this beautiful moment when the snowstorm was actually raging, even though you can't see it, but you can only see it by the ripples of the water. And actually here I'm, I'm barely standing because the, the wind is so strong, but, um, but it does have this peaceful, peaceful um, feel. And 
Arctic is this way. I think it's 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 very um, uh, it's uh, it's very hard to sometimes you look at look at the situation, look at the landscape, and it looks very peaceful. But it's in, in in fact it's just a very cold day, windy and dangerous, and and um, it's just a very there's this duality always of beauty and, and harshness. And this is Evgenia at the in their house at the station. She's reading a book, and this is the um, um, the uh, handmade radiator heater that uh, Ivan made of all kinds of parts. There are very people are very inventive in the stations and this outpost because there's very little things, but they managed to make a lot out of them actually. And this is the house and the final picture from the series. Um, when I was taking this photograph, I was kind of thinking about um, Dorothy's house from uh, Wizard of Oz. How, and it did, it did feel like the wind was so strong that it did feel that, you know, at some point it will just fly away. So here I spent three weeks um, at, at, at the station, and uh, we were we became really good friends with Evgenia, and um, we're still communicating. And she sends me they, they now have internet, so she sends me on WhatsApp photographs of like blooming flowers and things, and um, first snow, and it's just really nice to to be connected with them and, and kind of feeling like I'm there. And the next place is Dixon. And this is another place that I visited in 2013. And it was uh, autumn when I visited first. And it had such a strong impact on me. I remember there is a one meteorological station in town, but the rest of the town is completely abandoned. And it's a similar town to Tixi to my hometown because it's also a, a seaport. And as I was walking the streets of this empty town, I felt so drained of energy because I was overwhelmed by the scale of abandonment of this place. And I, and instead of taking pictures, I just couldn't help myself but falling asleep <laughs> at the at the station because I think I was just so overwhelmed. And um, and I decided that I have to come back. And and I thought that thinking of kind of the, um, the fact that it, images of Tixi didn't really work in, 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 in fall. I thought that I have to come back in, in, in winter. And I thought that I have to find a way to photograph this eeriness, eeriness of this place and su surrealism of it all. And I thought that I will just have to wait for Northern Lights because this neon color can really bring up that um, surreal and and kind of um, unmagical um, feel that I had when I was there. More like not like magical, more like a horror. Um, and so I went there, and as I said, I was staying in the meteorological station that is a few kilometers away from the town. And every day I would walk um, empty streets, trying to make pictures, but there was no, because it's polar night again, it's pitch dark, it was, it didn't, it didn't work. And Aurora wasn't, wasn't appearing. And, um, and then, so we were waiting and waiting and waiting for a couple of weeks. And suddenly one day it just exploded. And it was, and luckily I already, by, by then I already knew every corner of the town and I thought, okay, I have, in the best case scenario, I probably have an hour to, to photograph. And so I was just running, even though it was very cold, I was running and sweating, trying to really capture the, this kind of key, key places in this town. And this is the, uh, the um, monument, monument of for soldiers who defended Dixon during World War II um, from German submarines. And um, this is the only human uh, in, in town. And he, he actually spoke to me really uh, first time when I was walking and just on, from, the, from kind of my side vision, I, I saw a man standing and I was really scared and I looked and it was the um, monument. And uh, so it, it, in this particular 
moment the, 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 the sky was very clear. This is another huge luck to have Aurora and clear sky and the stars and everything. I just felt like it was just this perfect moment. And as I was running around, I was just thanking everything and everyone and every element that is around me to allow me this window of, of perf perfection to, to give justice to, to things that I'm seeing. And this is a, um, a room in one of the buildings. So this is a fifth floor. I don't know what happened with this window. I don't know if anybody jumped from it or something. Um, and uh, it's really, really dark. So the exposure here is very long. I, I barely see anything. And um, I think the exposure is like two minutes or two and a half minutes. And I was photographing and then I started to hear all these crazy sounds like literally like in a horror film and um, I think I started like having gray hair at that moment because I didn't know what to do how to run through the corridor because this is where I hear the steps and, and like creaking sounds etc so I, I then I just like gathered all my courage and it just ran really really fast from this room this is in, uh, in, in the school and you can't see it here very well. Um, I actually noticed, noticed it only in the, when I came home um, that this book is called Wonderful World. And this is, a, a, I think it's a, a, a kind of a biology textbook. This is the main street. So here I'm using, um, I had a, 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 a a, a torch uh, that you, you, you know, this little torch, forehead torch. And as I was looking at it, I thought, wow, this, it, it really created this really beautiful effect of lighting the foreground of those of snowflakes and kind of created this movement and made it very cinematic. And, and then uh, Aurora disappeared and everything started to kind of come back to, to the darkness. And literally I was just, standing there and seeing how it just all melts back into, into the black. And then the final um, story that I'll show um, is from Chukotka region. I'm from Yakutia. This is, the, uh, this is the, um, the region neighboring with Chukotka. And Chukotka is the most far east region. Um, it neighbors with, it, um, it, it's separated from Alaska by Bering Strait. And so I've I've seen Chukchi people in my home in my home uh, region, and actually I was reminded uh, that well I'll tell this later. But um, um, I was dreaming to go to this place because of the of the culture of these people and that they are really truly living off the land and the sea. They're sea hunters. They're whale hunters and walrus hunters. They're gathering um, things from 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 land. And I decided to go to the most remote village um, because closer to kind of central towns, it's still, it's, you can feel that it's already quite influenced of course by Russian culture and uh, it's, you know, Soviet, I should say. And, um, and people are not as close to land and some of the hunting techniques are lost, but in the villages that are really up high North, um, they're so hard to reach. There's like a, a helicopter that flies there, a passenger helicopter that flies there only once a month. But because of the rough weather conditions, it, it can take, um, you know, a few months. People get stuck there all the time for a long time. And it took me about one month just to get there because of the constant weather delays. And when we arrived, I went there with my brother, who often helps me. He's a cinematographer. And um, um, we arrived to this village and we met um, hunters and they were just so welcoming. And one of the things that really amazed me and I, I, or reminded me how it used to be or how it should be when we just arrived to the village is 300 people. So everybody of course know each other's faces and, and instantly we were the strangers, the um, outsiders and we were walking on the street and everybody were looking at us. And then people just started say, asking us like, do you, have, do you have anything to eat? You haven't hunted yet. So 
um, do you need meat? Do you need fish? And they were, we were staying in local school and they were bringing us like fish and meat and all these things. And I thought, wow, this is a true understanding of, of support each other and, you know, knowing that we are, we, but we are, we might be hungry. They're really um, worried for us. And, uh, and I became very close with one family of hunters. And um, this is, um, this is the, one of the elders. He's actually living in the abandoned weather station a few kilometers from the village. He really likes his solitude. And he grew up he was born in Yaranga in the traditional um, Chukchi house, like a, like a teepee, like a conical uh, shaped house. And before Soviet people arrived, before Soviet colonization, and he still remembers the time when he saw first airplane, first Russian people, Russian speaking people. And he says that of course it was very hard. Um, life was very hard before Soviet arrived in the sense that there was not much technological progress, but there they were much more happy and the community was much stronger. This is uh, from one of albums from one of the villagers that one of the first airplanes that arrived to the village. And this is the um, Vika, um, a girl from from Nurmina. She's rehearsing traditional dance at the local cultural cultural house. Wall or skull in um, in the garage of one of the hunters. And this is a hunt for walrus. So they they've been, of course, hunting for for centuries. And the thing that fascinated me the most is just how much how they transform, how men transform from being on land and when they're at sea, and how they really become this. Yes, of course, they become predators, but they also become part of this element, part of um, animal world, and everything is connected in, in Chukchi understanding of the world. Of course, they're, they're already losing it, but I think, and they're not maybe verbalizing it as much, and I don't want to give an idea that, you know, it's all this perfect um, indigenous world there, but I think inside and in, in their deeper understanding and deeper um, vision of their land is still very much of respect of animals in a sense that when they take something from, from the sea, they always think and they feel the pain of animal. They, 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 they kill an animal, but they ask an animal like a whale in particular, to, they're asking for forgiveness. And for them, it's, it's, a, it's a circle of life, right? We take an energy from the sea, we take an energy from, from, from an animal, and then we, we pass it on to our children, to our community, and then we perish in the land, et cetera, et cetera. It's all like circular world. And um, this is a photograph that actually um, is, has influenced the uh, couple of, and the last past two years of my life. Um, this is in the hut with the, um, uh, with the scientists. We spent a couple of weeks there. And this is one of the biggest, largest, uh, not one, it's the largest uh, walrus holdout place on the planet. There's about 100,000 walruses that hold out on this beach, which is of course not, um, not a normal thing. It, they do it because they, they're, the ice, there's no ice on, on, in the Arctic Ocean to rest on for them during their migration and feeding. So they're all forced on, on, on this land and there's a lot of trampling and stampedes and, um, and deaths of, of these animals. And I took this photograph and this stayed with me, not the, main, not the kind of panoramic images, but this particular one. And for the, for the next couple of years, um, during the pandemic, actually, um, I went and um, made a, a film, documentary film in this place. And it's my first experience and it's really exciting. And I'm actually in the post-production phase right now. And this is the final image. And this is the, uh, the whale that was hunted during the day, but it, it took us a really long time to take it back to, to the village. And... Uh, 
this is the this is the moment when I actually felt all the the, the understanding of the way Chukchi people feel the, the land and the sea came to me in this moment when we were tagging this beautiful animal and I couldn't help myself but being of course really really sad about it but then everybody else on the boat were really sad about it and and they were and that's when they told me when I tried to talk they were just like let's not talk and um and they said we are inside everybody in the boat have to ask the sea for forgiveness for taking its child and explaining that it's done for the for the good of the people <laughs> 